Toronto, Canada, a vibrant and prosperous world city with a cultural diversity that makes it one of the most enviable metropolitan regions on Earth. What unites the many different regions of Toronto and brings its people together is the TTC, a public transit network that moves 1.5 million riders a day throughout the city. Owned by the people and operated by a commission that is publicly accountable, the TTC is North America's third largest mass transit system. Throughout most of the 20th century, the TTC was widely regarded as one of the world's finest urban transit systems. Clean, safe, reliable, and constantly expanding to keep up with Toronto's great population growth. Today, however, the TTC is not the world leader it once was. Crumbling stations, overcrowding, frequent delays and large areas of the city without adequate service. Customer complaints have been rising steadily. Three days ago, I was waiting to come home on the LRT and I had to wait for two trains to pass by before I could actually get on. And once I got on, it was standing room only. We're like crushed sardines. If you live downtown, you know, you're hopping on a subway, you know it comes every five minutes. It's not affected by snow, by traffic or anything. You live in Jane and Finch, you basically need to have a car. You know what I mean? Like you want to go to Shoppers Drug Mart, you got it. What, are you going to walk half an hour or wait for the bus for 15 minutes? The TTC has not been able to keep up with population growth in the greater Toronto area, leading to traffic congestion that a Toronto Board of Trade study found was the worst in North America. What happened to the TTC? Dr. Paul Mees of the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Australia is an international expert on public transit policy. His PhD thesis was a comparison of the transit systems in Toronto and Melbourne. It's certainly true that the TTC has gone through a bad patch probably in the last 20 years. It was hit very badly by funding cutbacks uh, under the uh, premiership of Mike Harris and his successors. For decades, the TTC was adequately subsidised by the provincial government. Conservative Premier Bill Davis, Liberal Premier David Peterson and NDP Premier Bob Ray all put in the province's fair share. That ended in 1996, when the Conservative government of Mike Harris cut the provincial contribution to transit in Ontario's capital. For a whole bunch of reasons, the province has not come to the table uh, to pay their fair share of operating costs, which means you and me and a whole bunch of other transit users have had to pay more and more in TTC fares. That's not fair. In fact, the TTC is the least subsidized public transit system in all of North America. Without proper funding, the TTC struggles just to maintain the system we have. Few politicians have the courage to propose raising taxes to properly fund public transit, even though the economic and environmental benefits are obvious. Some have proposed privatization as the way out of this dilemma. And these days, the buzzwords for privatization are public-private partnerships. It sounds better than privatization, but is there really any difference? P3 is short for public-private partnership. It's the most recent uh, brand name that's been invented to sell privatisation to people. They had to come up with a new name so that they could say, yes, privatisation failed before, but this is a new form, and this, this, one, this time for sure, this one will definitely work. The, the idea that somehow uh, public-private partnerships are some sort of miracle solution, uh, they're not. They're simply a, a higher interest, higher profit construction of the same project that could be done for probably somewhere in the order uh, of 16 to 20 percent less uh, if it was done by the public. For some reason in Canada we seem to believe that we're going to reinvent this idea and that it's going to somehow uh, work in Canada even though it hasn't worked anywhere else. Obviously proponents of privatization have not done their homework. It's been tried elsewhere and the results have ranged from disappointment to disaster. England is home to two of the most glaring examples of privatization gone wrong. The mania for privatizing public services was set in motion by Margaret Thatcher's conservative government in the 1980s. Privatization of the British Rail Network in 1996 was not only a financial disaster, but a human tragedy as well. In 1999, the Paddington train crash was directly linked to cutbacks by the new private operator, 31 people died, and more than 500 were injured. Even this was not enough to put the brakes on privatization. 
In 2003, the publicly run London Underground began operating as a public-private partnership run by two private companies, Metronet and TubeLines. This P3 stands out as one of the worst financial disasters in transit privatization. This is Gordon Brown's doing, a public-private partnership with Metronet Rail to renew and maintain London's underground network, the largest P3 in all of the UK, a 30-year contract worth £17 billion. Like Prime Minister before him, Brown thought the private sector would do the work more efficiently than the public. But once again, it's not working as promised. It's estimated that in just the first seven and a half years, there'll be an overspend of more than a billion pounds of taxpayers' money. Another P3 disaster. We're paying really extortionate fees and the service that we're getting isn't exactly what we call perfect. They're always late for meetings or for work and you hate using the excuse when I was stuck on the tube because it's just happened so often. London's mayor, Ken Livingstone, was opposed to this public-private partnership. He makes no secret of his feelings for Metronet. The fault solely lies with Metronet. And my, I mean, my view is if they think they're going to get away with having taken the money and not doing the work, they've got another thing coming. My best advice to them is they should to go into liquidation, let us take it back, they can go off into a quiet room and, and take a suicide pill, as far as I'm concerned. The failure of the London Underground P3 was total. In May 2010, the publicly administered body Transport for London took back in-house all maintenance from both Metronet and Tube Lines. The new mayor of London, Boris Johnson, minced no words when he called the P3 looting. Ultimately, taxpayers paid half a billion pounds to lawyers, accountants, and long-gone executives to hammer out deals that were never implemented for services they never received. It isn't just in London that transit privatization has been disastrous. Around the globe, in Auckland, New Zealand, the public transit system was split up and sold off to numerous private companies. These providers split the city up into zones and demanded separate fares from commuters. In order to travel the equivalent distance of going from Scarborough to Etobicoke, an Auckland commuter is forced to pay up to 1650 in fares. If this system was applied in Toronto, Traveling across the city would become a nightmare, forcing the public to navigate through invisible and expensive zones within their own city. In nearby Melbourne, Australia, privatization resulted in increased subsidies from taxpayers and reduced and unreliable service for transit riders. Well, Melbourne's uh, trains and trams were publicly owned and operated for almost a century. In the 1990s, we had a Conservative government here that substantially reduced funding for public transport. Then in 1997, that same government decided to go the next step and to privatise the system. Now, they were very clear about what the objectives were. They wanted to reduce the subsidies and increase the quality of service. In 1999, privatisation came into effect. It's been a very spectacular failure since that time Adjusted for inflation, the subsidies have more than doubled. We're now paying almost three times as much in public subsidies as we were when the system was publicly run. The figure this year for operating subsidies alone is about 1.5 billion Australian dollars. Now that's four times the operating subsidy of the TTC, but we carry about one third less passengers than the TTC does. At the same time, the quality of service has deteriorated as well. If you live in Melbourne, for example, the majority of residents of Melbourne have no access to public transport at all after about 8 o'clock at night uh, or at all on Sundays. Every few weeks now, the entire Melbourne train system collapses. This kind of thing uh, didn't happen even in the very worst phases of public ownership. The community lost control of public transport and people feel powerless and frustrated and very angry about what's happening. Closer to home in Vancouver, B.C., the provincial Liberal government forced a public-private partnership onto the city. This began with the construction of the Canada Line, part of the glitzy 2010 Olympic bid. What we have now is one line which runs from Vancouver Airport down into uh, downtown Vancouver. That one line is now a public-private partnership. For 35 years, this Canada Line is going to draw money from the rest of the transit system. And 80% of the rides on the transit system are on buses. So effectively, it's the bus rider who is now subsidizing a public-private partnership that built a very expensive tunneled line. 
The provincial government went even further by transferring the governance of the public transit system to a private board of directors. Well, the board operates in secret, so there's no access for the public. We've got a board who aren't responsive to the public. It's a, a process that is rife with corruption because you're constantly in a situation where everything is secret. This move towards privatization has led to several devastating consequences that now plague Vancouver's transit system. What happens with the system? Well, you start out with the private sector, first of all, pumping up the cost of the system. The first thing that TransLink did when it, when it got in was to increase its salaries uh, enormously. If you look at the Canada line, the eventual cost was significantly higher than the public sector comparator. The eventual cost of the project cost another four or five hundred million dollars, a half a billion dollars. And in transit systems, you can't afford to lose that kind of money. The net effect of that is going to be that the individual citizen is going to have to pay more, and in paying more is then going to weigh more carefully whether or not they want to take public transit or take their private automobile. This increase in costs was accompanied by cutbacks in services. We've lost service on Granville Street. They've reduced the actual number of buses operating there. We've lost service on Canby Street. We've lost service on Oak Street. We've lost service on Fraser Street. The fact is, when you have a private transit system, every route is judged on profitability. If it's not profitable, it's cut. The effect is, some areas just won't have access to transit. It's not just transit riders and taxpayers who are hurt by the Canada Line P3. On Canby Street, business owners were adversely impacted by this project. This system was completed on time because they walked all over the neighborhoods that were impacted. Many, many people lost their businesses as a result of a line that put the priority on completing early over providing opportunities for those businesses to live through it. 